Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Elwood. I'm the dean here at the John F. Kennedy School. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum at the Institute of Politics. Uh, this is going to be a terrific, terrific afternoon. We have a spectacular public servant, someone who represents all of the values that we aspire to here at the Kennedy School, public service, both in the military as well as in a variety of other political contexts, certainly someone who we all know and admire. Um, here to interview him is Jill Doherty. And um, Jill is a longtime foreign affairs correspondent with CNN, um, the cable news network, and she's got an extensive background in all things Russian. And indeed, that happened at an early age. She said, when we were 13, year old, 13 years old, um, my sister and I uh, walked into our first Russian class. I was hooked from the very first da. Um, so, uh, of course, nothing's going on with Russia right now, so that won't be of any great use. She's also a fellow at the Shorenstein Center uh, on Media, Politics, and Public Policy. Um, she's been a CNN correspondent in all variety of situations, ranging from the State Department. She's traveled extensively with, with uh, uh, various presidents, uh, and she's done extensive coverage in uh, Russia and certainly with Vladimir Putin, Yeltsin, of um, post-Soviet transition, uh, Georgia, Chechnya, and most recently in Ukraine. I can't think of anyone better to interview our guest at this time than Jill Doherty. Please welcome her and thank you very much. Thank you. Well, well I am uh, really thrilled to be here. And uh, boy, Senator McKinney, it's great to see you again. We usually see each other in Washington, but uh, this is a, a really wonderful opportunity. I was going to say intimate uh, conversation here, but it's we've got the bleachers up there, so right. you've got a lot of people. I have and glad to hear it. And I'm sure there are a lot, <laughs> a lot of questions as well. So I think you all know the drill. I, I don't almost don't have to introduce Senator McCain, but you know he was first elected to office in 1982 uh, in the Senate for a very long time with a very distinguished career. He's uh, the son and the grandson of. Navy admirals. We know his history, which um, in, in Vietnam, uh, that uh, obviously is something that we respect very much in your service. And he is very involved, as we know, in foreign policy. He's on many committees, but especially armed services and the Committee on Foreign Relations. So uh, I want to start with uh, a question that I've been thinking about a deep uh, political question. I want to know who the Republicans are going to put up to run against Hillary Clinton's grandchild in 2052. <laughs> I'm thinking about it. <laughs> I'm sure you've got a lot of votes. Pale, tan, ready, rested. Ready. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, thank you for not mentioning that I ran for president, I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> um, well, wait, maybe, after, maybe can we, After uh, I lost, I slept like a baby. <laughs> sleep two hours, wake up and cry. Sleep two hours, wake up and cry. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Could I mention one other line that I- Absolutely, okay. absolutely. I ask your sympathy for the families of the state of Arizona, because Barry Goldwater from Arizona ran for president of the United States. A guy named Morris Udall from Arizona ran for president of the United States. A governor of ours, Bruce Babbitt, ran for president of the United States. I, from Arizona, ran for president of the United States. Arizona may be the only state in America where mothers don't tell their children that someday they can grow up and be <laughs> president of the United States. So I ask your sympathy. <laughs> so wait a minute, this time, are you gonna run in 2016? I just wanna make sure we put that on the record. Well, there's a lot of groundswell out there at the old soldier's home that <laughs> Want me to go back into the breach, but no, I think I've had my uh, chance. I, I accept the verdict of the American people. This guy, Morris Udall, by the way, who ran one of the funniest men in Congress, some of us old enough remember, he ran in a series of primaries against Jimmy Carter in 76, and finally lost, and he came out in front of the press and he said, the people have spoken, the bastards. <laughs> <laughs> I know how he felt. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, let's go on to some weighty uh, international issues, if Good. you will. Um, you just got back from a trip to Europe. You were in interesting places, too. Yes. Uh, Moldova being one of them. 
Uh, let's begin, obviously, with Ukraine. I, we cannot, we were both in the green room back there talking about um, comments by the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, which sounded ominous. Um, I know I was looking specifically, he said that any attack on Russian, Russia or Russian citizens' legitimate interests would be an attack on the Russian Federation, um, and it, Moscow will retaliate in kind. I mean, where, what would you say right now the United States should be doing with that, it looks like, a threat? Joe, could I mention first, I think we have to understand Vladimir Putin, what he's doing right now. I predicted that he would go into Crimea because his vision of restoration of the old Russian Empire depended on Sevastopol, the naval base, which is their avenue to the Mediterranean. Uh, I'm not predicting what he's going to do now because I'm not exactly sure what he's going to, if he's sure what he's going to do. Because I think he's, 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 way, uh, he's figuring both cost and benefit to further action in, uh, in Ukraine. Now, he wouldn't have 40,000 troops on the border if he wasn't at least considering his options. If he wasn't going to do something more, he obviously would have pulled them, pulled them back. So to ignore the obvious is, uh, I, I think, really not logical. So what, what is he doing right now? He's fomenting the unrest and taking over the cities with pro-Russian people, little green men, as they call them. And the, the government in Kiev, which is very weak and very new, is having to try to decide what their reaction is to all this. Should they go in and try, try, try to take some of these city halls and places back? Or should they just sort of hope that, that uh, Vladimir is, is satisfied? The, the general who's the head of NATO, General Breedlove, and I talked the other day, he thinks that among other options that Putin is predicting is to go across the south, take Odessa, which is one of their key ports for moving a lot of things, including drugs and arms and other things, and go up to Moldova, where in tri Transnistria you've got 1,500 Russian troops, quote, peacekeepers there, and of course Moldova has no military whatsoever. That's one of the options that he's, he's, uh, he's considering. The other one, of course, is to foment this unrest, try to disrupt the elections that are going to take place on May 25th, and also to delegitimize, to a large degree, uh, those people who are taking over their government. Remember in 2009, uh, they had another, uh, excuse me, 2004, they had another uprising and obviously it turned to ashes because of corruption and a whole lot of whole lot of other reasons which we won't waste time on. So I think the first thing we have to understand is what is Vladimir Putin, who is he, what does he want, and what are his aspirations? We know about the ruble crashing, we know about their stocks going down, we know all about that, but his popularity in Russia has skyrocketed. And, so, and he says that he can make up for the sanctions by selling oil and gas to China. Yeah, and, and I think he probably can, although that's going to take some construction, uh, obviously. So Vladimir Putin is a KGB colonel that wants to, he said on several occasions, not me, but he said the greatest disaster of the 20th century was the breakup of the Soviet Union. So if we understand Vladimir Putin and what his ambitions are and who he is, then I think we can adequately uh, develop a response that could be effective. And, and it has to be that? pretty tough. What is that, though? Well, to start I mean, with. If, they, if start they, with, they go across the border you can, with troops, what do you do? From short term, providing the Ukrainians with some defensive weapons. Now, this is how ludicrous this situation has become. They wanted to give MREs, the uh, meals ready to eat, to Ukraine, but they didn't want to fly them in in American airplanes because they didn't want to provoke Vladimir Putin. So they sent it, these MREs in by trucks. And by the way, we found out in uh, Syria that MREs don't do very well against helicopters and tanks. But so, uh, so the th ranging from giving them some weapons to fight with helping them with training. By the way, we have military assistance programs with some 50 countries. And then in the long term, 
develop a plan that can be implemented sooner than a lot of people predict to make Europe and Ukraine energy uh, um, no more independent, make, make these countries independent of their dependence on energy, oil and gas. And we can do that over time. And if it was a crash program, we could do it a lot faster than, than people think. Now, in between, uh, obviously, um, I, I think restoring the uh, missile defense systems in the Czech Republic and Poland. Uh, arming and training, uh, and we're doing some of this now. 600 of our troops are uh, in uh, Poland right now as we speak. Uh, readjust our force structure to the new kind of challenges uh, we have. Economic sanctions that are tough. Do you know in response for the Russians absorbing Crimea, which by the way, they signed a solemn uh, agreement when Ukraine, which was then the third largest nuclear power, turned over their nuclear weapons, and in return for that, there was a written agreement on the part of the Russians, the United States, and the British that the territorial integrity of Ukraine will be preserved, which included Crimea. So, um, but, but uh, Senator, you've been yep. very critical of the administration. I mean, let's say, d just very quickly, because we don't have that much time, yeah, yeah. the I'm Russian, sorry, the something answer. happens mm -hmm. in which a Russian citizen, of however you define that, is killed. And the Russians decide that they have to go in, protect their rights, and the tanks go in. What does the United States do? The United States, at this particular point in history, we could have done a lot of things a long time ago, but right now at this point in history, I hate to say it. I, I, it, it makes me almost uh, s terribly sad to say this, but there's nothing that we can do that, that would have immediate consequence except to make it clear that we are back not in the Cold War, traditional Cold War, but we are now in a situation where we have to contain Russia. We have to go back to George Kennan, containment of Russia. Because if, if Russia continues to succeed, my friends, I guarantee you Moldova is next. I just came from the Baltics. They're scared to death. I hate to put it that way, but they're scared to death. These three little Baltic countries that they're part of NATO, and they're not sure that Article 5 of the NATO charter, when an attack on one, an attack on all, will prevail. So um, I think we would have to obviously take the, the sanctions, the, uh, uh, the diplomatic uh, situation, the, the, any kind of a, a agreement or, or uh, anything that we do that would benefit Russia would have to be stopped. And by the way, until they become energy independent, my dear friends, the other bad news is Europeans aren't going to do anything. They're not going to do anything. Mark my words. There'll be a lot of rhetoric. They won't do anything. They're too dependent on the energy from Russia. I, w I would like to tell you something different. Let's move to another part of the world. Let's move to China. Um, you have another very serious... By the serious way, could I just mention? Sure. You know I was sanctioned by Vladimir Putin. Did you know that? You and he don't get along very yeah, well, Yeah, I was sanctioned by what him. What is this? I had, to, I had to cancel spring break in Siberia this year. <laughs> it was terrible. Why but doesn't he like you? I, did, I just don't understand this. I don't understand. <laughs> Why one, don't you time like him? He told, one time he told, I think it was a, a British diplomat, said, I have two big problems, Chechnya and McCain. <laughs> so I was flattered to, to know that he felt so strongly about me. But anyway. Boy, okay, well, yeah. on to China. We have you know, another very dangerous situation. China, in essence, bullying the friends and allies of the United States. You have the uh, their claim to the Senkaku Islands with, J with Japan. You have the Philippines also being threatened. You have movements against uh, our friends in Vietnam. Uh, what does the United States do? What should Could I do? just sum up be before we leave Ukraine? The richest, most powerful, uh, strongest nation in the world can find ways to contain Vladimir Putin if we develop strategies to do so. I mean, I can't go through more detail with you, but we still are the preeminent power in the world. So to think we can't do anything about Vladimir Putin is just uh, sophistry. On China, um, the Chinese believe that the last 200 years were accidents of history. The Chinese believe that they have a traditional role to play in Asia of the power in Asia. One time I spoke to Lee Kuan Yew, probably the smartest person I ever met in my life, 
the guy that founded Singapore. Um, and he said, the, the Chinese will build up their military until they will tell you to move out of, Eastern, of Western uh, Pacific, and you, can, you Americans can have the Eastern Pacific. But they believe that that part of the world is traditionally and historically uh, dominated by, uh, by China. Now, they are rapidly developing their military, and they do a pretty good job at it. The day that Chuck Hagel testified before the Senate Armed Services Committee a couple of weeks ago about the massive cuts we're making in defense, the Chinese announced a 12.2% increase in, in their defense spending. Now, I don't think they're really ready nor eager to challenge us militarily, but I do believe that they are acting in a very aggressive fashion. The Philippines, for example, have one patrol craft. The Chinese have a very uh, strong navy. Our new best friends, by the way, are Vietnam which shows, uh, well, there's a ship named after my father and grandfather that uh, is in the Pacific and made a port visit to Da Nang not long ago, which shows if you live long enough, anything can happen. <laughs> but, um, so, but one effect it has had, Jill, is it has really United Nations united them in a way that uh, not many years ago we would never have predicted. I don't think that the Chinese lack patience but sometimes I see them say things and do things which are not smart. If they're, re they're, they're, they're not as smart as we think they are. But you do have two, let's say, take China and Japan. You have two countries that are very important to the United States. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan, an ally. China, a country with which the United States has to have a very uh, robust and, and delicately handled relationship. How do you do that? when you want to, obviously, you want to tell them not to bully the rest of Asia at the same time that you want a relationship. How do you do that? Well, first of all, the Syria decision has reverberated around the globe, um, and we can get into that mm -hmm. maybe later on. But the Japanese now are now believe that they have to assume a much greater responsibility than they've had in the past for events in, in that part of the world. The new prime minister, who for the first time has got a p clear path for five years as, as prime minister, has done things which I don't agree with, like visit the shrine from World War II where war criminals are buried. But more importantly, uh, they are reinterpreting their constitution to give them much more latitude militarily. And there is this brinksmanship that goes on over the Sinkakus and other places with other nations that sooner or later, unless there's a down, uh, a, a, a diminishment of this kind of, of uh, provocation and brinksmanship, that there's going to be some kind of uh, uh, you know, naval engagement uh, of some kind. So I think that the important thing is that the Asian nations stick together that they make it clear to China that they, uh, that freedom of the oceans and navigation is a fundamental principle of international behavior. And, but it's going to be very interesting. This new guy is cracked down on corruption. I think he may be as smart. He certainly has charisma. Um, but I, I think that they are going to gradually try to assert more and more control over that part of the of the Pacific and then, and then move to the east. Um, but I'm very nervous about it, particularly since the Chinese uh, are, excuse me, since the Japanese are feeling very threatened. Mm. And uh, that's not good. And mm -hmm. By the way, one of the biggest problems, the thing that bothers me as much as anything else is the estrangement between South Korea and Japan. It's over these comfort women. Their, their adversary is not each other. Their adversary is China. And I, every time I meet with them, I say, please sit down together. People have got to come together. We have come together with our uh, people that we had wars with. They should do the same. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about Syria. You raise that issue. Um, you know, it would appear now that we're how many years into this that... Uh, Three. <laughs> it's a sad commentary, isn't it? Um, that nothing much is going to happen, <laughs> it, uh, realistically. Um, what do you ascribe that to? I mean, are you, uh, I know some, in many cases you would blame the administration, but I mean, has the United States, 
setting it in a broader historical context. Has the United States kind of overlearned that lesson of retrenchment I after after Iraq and Afghanistan? I hear that over and over and over and over and over again. Americans are war weary. Mm -hmm. My friends, when Ronald Reagan came to office, it had only been a few years since we lost 55,000 Americans in the Vietnam War. So I don't buy this uh, Americans are war weary, particularly when I visit a refugee camp where there's thousands of children mm -hmm. running around and people having to sell their daughters in order to exist and to watch the malnutrition and the beatings and the, uh, the horrors that are being inflicted on these people by Is Bashar there? Assad with Russian weapons and with U Iranian weapons. And do I, if I sound emotional, I'm emotional. I'm guilty. I'm emotional. When I see people whose lives have been destroyed, I, when I see the bodies of these, these children that have been gassed with chemical weapons, when I see all these things and I see us sit back, oh, we're war weary. Well, uh, I, I don't buy it. I think that the United States is, is, will have a dark chapter in our history because for the first year at least of this conflict, they had Bashar Assad on the run. Then a couple of things happened. One, the Iranians convinced 5,000 Hezbollah, good, tough fighters, to come into the fight. They, the uh, Russians stepped up their arms uh, supplies dramatically. The Iranians trained the uh, Iranian Revolutionary Guard and began a training program of Syrians coming in to, uh, back into Syria to kill people. And then, of course, this incredibly brutal, uh, these, right now they're dropping these cylinders that they call barrel bombs on people indiscriminately from helicopters. And I, I begged them, I, I did, I've never begged anybody, I begged the President of the United States, please give these people some weapons. Please send them some weapons. The way we did in Afghanistan when the Russians invaded Afghanistan and they finally drove them out. I begged them. I said, this, this conflict, the longer it lasts, the worse it's going to get. And no, they couldn't do that. They couldn't do that at all. They sent some MREs. That was good. Uh, so is it right too late? Is it too late? I pray that it's not too late. I pray that it's not too late. I will never give up for them. I'll never forget being in a refugee camp, thousands of kids running. Do you know that there's a million refugees in Lebanon? A million? Think of what it'd be like in the United States if we had a million refugees. There's a million there in this tiny country. I was riding around with this woman and, and uh, who was a school teacher in, the, in a camp in Jordan, and she said, see all these little children, Senator? I said, yeah. She said, they know that you Americans have abandoned them, and they're going to take revenge on you when they grow up. Now, what are we breeding now? Mm. It, 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 it's, it's, I, 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 wanna, I won't go on any longer, but it does, it almost makes me cry to mm. see what happens to these people and the total disregard of the media and the President of the United States and anybody else uh, uh, the, the, uh, on, on this, this tragedy that's going on. 150,000 people killed? Isn't that enough? When is it enough? That's what I asked. That's what I asked. Uh, oh, and by the way, it was a year and a half ago, both Leon Panetta, then Secretary of Defense, and uh, General Dempsey said, Senator, the fall of Bashar Assad is inevitable at the hearing at the Senate Armed Services Committee. And I said, excuse me, sir, it's not inevitable. Not unless we help them. No, no, it's inevitable. Well, this is the kind of leadership we got. You know, we have about um, three minutes, four minutes left before we open up to questions. <clears throat> and I want to, I'm really dying to hear these questions because I think we got some good ones. But I just want to ask you kind of a, um, almost a philosophical question. You know, with the new Pope, Pope Francis, he's talking about um, un, as he put it, unbridled capitalism as the new tyranny. And this message seems to be resonating with a lot of people. Um, do you subscribe to what he is saying about capitalism and the need to really help people who are less fortunate, but especially the comments about capitalism? First of all, I would hate to disagree with the Pope, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I do. We'll give you a I do agree. That, I do agree. For here, for I here. do agree that there is a rising gap between the wealthiest and middle-income and lower-income Americans. The, the facts substantiate that, and obviously, with the new innovations of technology, there's more and more opportunity for well-educated, and there's less and less for those who are less educated. 
And I think a big part of the problem goes back to quality of education. And I know everybody in this room is grateful for having the opportunity of being here at this institution. Uh, and I hope you'll pay back by looking at programs such as Teach for America and others. It's the end of the commercial. The, <laughs> the, uh, so uh, I, I think that we have to look at education, but frankly, you also have to look at the tax code, wh which we have, we have a tax code that that's high. If there's anybody in this room that understands our tax code, please raise your hand. I'd like to bring you to Washington. And, and so, uh, so we need to reform the tax code. We need to have a better education system. We need to have, you know, I'm offended when I hear one of these CEOs make $58 million for 14 months in his job. I think I, mm -hmm. I, 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 saw the, I saw the other day. I'm offended by that. But I also don't agree that the way to level it is to bring wealthy people down. I believe the way to do it is to bring people who are less well off up. And so that may be a, a slight nuance that I have. So he's not a Marxist? No, I don't think so. I, d I think that we should all be for equal opportunity for all of our citizens, and that's not the case today. And that's another reason why we need immigration reform. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I think uh, we're right on time to open it up to questions. And uh, we have four microphones, one, two, and then where's it? Oh, there it is, three, four. And I think you know the, the uh, rules and regulations here, which is please to identify yourself, um, ask a question, and not necessarily a comment, um, and let's begin. We'll begin right over there with Angela Santana. You can use an, a, <coughs> use an assumed name if you want. <laughs> Hi, as Senator, thank you so much for speaking. My name is Alex Jurgen. I'm a joint student between the Kennedy School and the Business School. I'm the president of the Business School Republicans. I had the honor of working on your campaign in 2008. How many, how many members do you have? <laughs> we, 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 we can do more. We can actually fill a phone booth. But uh, no, we actually have, we, we have a decent size. Uh, more, more students just haven't publicly admitted that they're Republican. Um, <laughs> anyways, my question, sorry to bring up this topic again, but what, what advice do you have for our candidates who are running in 2016? Mm, I th the, the biggest thing I think to win is to be, make sure that you believe what you say. I have seen many candidates in all levels that will say things and take positions that they don't believe in. And whether you win or lose, that's not the point. But if you get a win or if you win and you've made promises that you can't and don't want to keep, then I think it tarnishes you for a, a history. We all want to be, especially when you get a little older, we're worried about our place in history more than anything else, how people will judge us. And if you go through a campaign and tell people things that are not true, then, uh, and that you don't believe in, then you're gonna pay a penalty. In the 2000 campaign, there was a situation in South Carolina where the Confederate flag flew over the state capitol, okay? And they asked me about it. And I said, after talking to some of my political friends, I said, well, it's a state issue. It's a state issue. Not, I'm not gonna get into it. Well, that was a lie. That was, that was a false statement. And I went back after the, after the campaign and apologized, but, uh, that's one of my biggest regrets, frankly, of all the campaigns that I've been in, so. Okay, uh, let's go up to the next level there. Thank you. None in the cheap seats, we don't want them. Go ahead. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Ben Boltra and I'm a Harvard alum. I have a question about the presidential election system that we have right now. Um, with the, with the, the way the states, uh, the state run elections are, people uh, will fundraise in major states. Uh, they might fundraise in New York, Los Angeles, Boston. But then the swing states, people will actually campaign in the general election in uh, Ohio, Florida, and so forth. I'm wondering if you can reflect on the wisdom of the current system and if there's a need for campaign reform so that people actually will end up you know, campaigning in California, New York, and, and elsewhere in, in, in campaigning for a national election as opposed to a state-by-state -state process. It's not so much the state by state because if you only had it you know, by population, then no one would go to a lot of the small states. They would only campaign there. So that would be discriminatory against people in small states. But what we really need to do is have campaign finance reform. What the United States Supreme Court has done now in two decisions, in my view, is probably the worst decision since Dred Scott. And I'm not exaggerating. There is so much money washing around 
the political system, most of it we don't know who they are, and I predict to you there will be a major scandal, a major scandal, because there's too much money washing around the political system that nobody knows where it came from. So, and then we go through historically reform, corruption, reform, corruption. Right now we're at, in my view, we're at the height of corruption, thanks to the United States Supreme Court. Hmm. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> Hi, Senator. Um, my name is John Soylu. I'm a college from Turkey. Uh, I'm a college senior from Turkey. Um, and I have huge respect for your service, and I wanted to thank you for coming here. I have a question about your activities, uh, your activism abroad. I was wondering how you coordinate these uh, activities with you know, the State Department, and do you ever worry about the optics sort of helping people like Putin who think the U.S. is behind everything? Uh, you being you know, there standing yeah. with the protesters, does it, does it sort of help those guys? You know, I always uh, have some sense of caution about that until I see what's happening. And frankly, I, I have sons. One of them is still serving. Another one is about to serve again. Um, I can't let these things happen, which may sooner or later, because of America's weakness, put these young people into harm's way. I've seen too many people, too many people who have suffered the wounds of war. And so I try to be careful. But for me to stand by and watch the things that are happening in the world today, uh, frankly, I, then I am abrogating my responsibilities to the people of Arizona that I represent. Hmm. Thank okay. you. And the uh, young woman there? Hi, sir. My name is Charlie. I'm a sophomore at the college, and I'm also a cadet in Army ROTC here. Um, first, I just want to thank you for being here. It's a really an honor to have you. And also, thank you for your service, as well as your second service. Could I say it's I'm really very, inspiring. very proud that there is ROTC on this campus. I think it's thank wonderful. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. That means a lot to us. I also, um, would it be okay if I still pass you? Well, I'm sorry. Thanks. I have for you, uh, we just made t-shirts. And on behalf of all of the cadets and midshipmen at Harvard, we'd like to present you with our Harvard ROTC t-shirts. On I'm the front, sure. it says Harvard ROTC. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Excellent. Excellent awesome. gift, and do you have a question? I do, yes, as well. Um, two years ago, as you know, sir, ROTC was welcome back to Harvard, and in many of the uh, schools here, it is the military and veterans are truly embraced. Unfortunately, we haven't really found that at the college. ROTC has been welcomed back in name only. Um, at best, they are indifferent to us. At worst, they create obstacles, really, to our success and to our growth. Um, so I was wondering, first, w how you think we can convince institutions like Harvard that the military really is important and really will benefit Harvard uh, to be a part of that process. And also, second, we have 24 students out of a population of 6,000 college kids who are in Army ROTC. So how do we convince students at colleges like Harvard that the military truly is important and it's a career that they should consider? I hope some of the student leaders and faculty that are respected and admired um, would uh, promote more the concept of, uh, of military service. Harvard ranks amongst the highest of applicants for Teach for America, a wonderful program where people, as you know, go into inner cities and Indian reservations, et cetera. I'd like to see that same kind of emphasis given to those who might consider a, a career in the military as well. But I think there's a been, been a big step forward. In my generation, uh, when people came home from Vietnam, 18, 19, 20 years old, they were badly treated by the Americans. And at least today, and I'm very proud that Americans treat, whether they are for or against our involvement in these conflicts, they treat them with respect and honor them. So we've come a long way, and maybe we can get Harvard to go just one step further. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, Senator McCain. Uh, my name is Sita Gofard. I'm a junior at the college, and it's such an honor and a pleasure to have you here to hear you speak. Thank you for your service. Um, I wanted to ask you about gun control and reducing gun violence in America. Uh, you'll remember that uh, it was in Arizona where, where um, a U.S. representative was shot and several others were killed. And since then, there have been so many, too many, tragic incidents of gun violence across America in schools and theaters. Um, it's also an issue that the Republican Party is grappling with a lot. So what is your take on 
um, what needs to be done to reduce gun violence in America. And let's say you could pass any legislation in the Senate. What would that legislation include? We did pass legislation, a Toomey Mansion bill, which uh, tightened up uh, on, uh, on background checks, which I thought I voted for. And uh, it, it, it is an emotional issue. It is one that divides our country a lot between rural and urban. Um, and it is a constitutional issue as well in some respects. Certainly, a lot of people interpret it as a constitutional issue. I voted for the Cattuni Mansion and supported that, co uh, that compromise. If there is further compromise that we can get done on a bipartisan basis, I would be glad uh, to do that. At the same time, people do, and it's, it's clear in the Constitution, have the right to own weapons. And there are some places, for example, in Chicago, uh, where more murders are committed than any place else in the country, and they're done with handguns. And so does that mean we should outlaw handguns? I'm not sure that that's the answer. I think it's a cultural problem, and equally, equally troubling, of course, are these people that decide to take weapons into schools and other places. It's a terrible problem, and we've got to try to figure it out. And I know that's not a very good answer because I wrestle with it all the time. All right, up there, please. Hello, Hello Senator. My name is Martin Weivots. I'm uh, a second year at the business school. I'm also one of the few Harvard students from Latvia. And uh, I'd like to take the opportunity, opportunity to thank you for your support and solidarity. Um, my question for you is that um, it seems the more wrong Vladimir Putin does, the more popular he is at home, and he, he depends on this popularity rating. What needs to happen in the external environment for that trend to be reversed? Uh, Vladimir Putin gave a speech after Crimea and about the Russian-speaking people and how they had to protect their rights, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera, after Crimea. So I went back and looked up Adolf Hitler's speech from the balcony of a hotel in Vienna after the Anschluss when they moved in into uh, Austria. <laughs> I tell you, it's very similar uh, verbiage that uh, is used. I think that, that we ought to look back. I don't predict ever a World War III, but I do predict that if Vladimir Putin thinks that he can get away with things, he's going to continue to do it. So I think that we need to uh, bolster the, the defenses of Latvia uh, we got a commitment from their president that they would increase their defense spending, which has been abysmal, as you know. And we're going to have to station troops there. We went to a, uh, uh, a uh, joint exercise that was between U.S. Marines and Latvian military, which was very impressive. So there, we, we need to do that. What we have to do is things to convince Vladimir Putin that the price of further misbehavior doesn't balance to, out to the benefit. And right now, when you've only sanctioned 11 people in one bank, put yourself in his shoes. He's done pretty well. He's taken Crimea, and 11 people have been sanctioned. That, that's not exactly what I'd call deterrence. Thank you, and I love your country. Riga is one of the beautiful places on Earth, and I love to, to go there and spend some time. Thank you. It's good that we have a lot of uh, international students here getting some good questions. Yes, please. Hi, Senator. Um, I'm from Ukraine, from Eastern Ukraine, and I'm a graduate student of International Relations and College Civitas in Warsaw. And first of all, I wanted to thank you for being there with us on Maidan. Uh, and my question would be, um, based on a casual, uh, very popular belief that um, Putin will not invade Ukraine. He will not initiate a, a full-scale military invasion. Um, to what extent, what are the chances that we are wrong? Are there any signals that would indicate that such a scenario is not so improbable? Um, what, what's your take on that? And well, First of all, um, I was in Maidan uh, where there was 250,000 people in freezing cold uh, demonstrating because they wanted to get rid of one of the more corrupt uh, dictators in the world, Yanukovych, whose son, by the way, was a dentist, made a billion dollars. That's a good practice of dentistry. Uh, 
And, and I know, and you know, what the people of Ukraine want, especially young people like you. You want to be part of Europe. It's the music. It's the culture. It's the, it's the lack of corruption. It's, it's everything about Europe that attracts them. And look, today, uh, Foreign Minister Lavrov said, well, any more provocations uh, uh, and, and attacks on Russian on citizens, we'll have to go in. He's, he, they're playing at least brinksmanship right now. And I think we'll know in the next few days or maybe weeks uh, what, uh, what's going to happen. But I'll tell you, it was an inspiring experience for me to be in, in Maidan uh, with all those people. And most of them were your age. Thank you. Mm. OK, right here, please. Hello. <coughs> My name is Saba Beridze, and I'm from Republic of Georgia. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I, we did not plan this. I mean, this is... is Anti-Russian. Okay. okay. Yes, please. Uh, so going back to your discussion about Crimea, you talked about Russia, Ukraine, you talked about uh, Moldova, but you did not mention any word about my country, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> my, my, my question is as follows, like, uh, if United States and the Western powers, like, uh, imposed sanctions against Russia in 2008 when Russia impudently violated my country's borders and killed a lot of people and made, like, cleansing of the human beings, Georgians, there. Do you believe that we would be able to, like, dissuade Vladimir Putin from annexing Crimea? Again, I don't know what he's going to do. You know full well of his uh, <coughs> uh, absorbing Abkhazia and South Ossetia. You also know that he moves the fences a couple of hundred meters every few months further and further inside Georgia, that they commit a lot of acts of, of provocation. And by the way, when it happened, it was during the presidential campaign. And I said, we are all Georgians. And you know, I was ridiculed for that. I was ridiculed for saying that we were all we were all ridiculed that we were uh, that that we were all Georgian. I, I I think the greatest novel ever written in my mind is For Whom the Bell Tolls, and that, that the title of that book was taken from the poem by John Donne. Ask not for whom the bell tolls; it tolls for thee. We should have cared about the people in Georgia. We should have cared about naked aggression taking place in Georgia. And I think that that was a precursor to some of the other things that are happening today because he got away with it. And so all I can say is I have done everything I can to help Georgia and the people of Georgia in that beautiful, mag majestic, majestic country uh, that is just so beautiful, but the people deserve better than what they're getting. And by the way, my friends, even though I may not have been overjoyed at the outcome, there was a free and fair election in Georgia for the, probably for the first time in their history. And that, I think, was an important achievement. Yes, sir. Thank you, Senator. Uh, my name is Jose Sanchez, and I'm an MPA student here at the Kennedy School, and I'm from the Republic of Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Another secessionist <laughs> movement. <laughs> yes. Um, I want to first thank you so much for being a big supporter of, of immigration. In all these years that you've been in the Senate, I've uh, been a very uh, supporter of you, even though I'm not Republican. And I want to ask a question. Uh, what do you think is going to take... Um, after your Senate bill that y'all passed last summer, uh, what is it going to take for the speaker to actually put a vote on it or come up with their own bill? And if they don't, by 2016, how is that going to affect the presidential election? I, th uh, I think that the Republican Party will never win another nationwide election unless we enact immigration, comprehensive immigration reform. That's not the reason why. That's not the reason why. That's not the reason why I support this reform. I support it because there's 11 million people living in the shadows in this country without the rights and privileges of, of citizenry, and they're being abused every day, and they can contribute an enormous amount to our society, just as the Irish and the Poles and the, uh, and the Jews and the Italians and everybody, every other wave that came uh, to this country and contribute to it. And the point is that if you've got 11 million people living in this country illegally, you know, there's not enough buses to deport them, then it's de facto amnesty. You know, they used to call Lindsey Graham, Lindsey Gomez and, and Amnesty John. That was the talk show guys. Uh, what was our name? Look, if, if they're not going home, okay? They're not going home. And so 
why don't we give them a path to citizenship? And if my friends, if you look at that legislation, it is tough. It's 10 years before they get a green card, thousands of dollars in fees. This is no amnesty. It's really tough. But if you don't, if you keep these people in the shadows in this nation, it is a stain on America's honor. So, uh, and by the way, I am insistent on one thing, and that is when we pass it, and I still think we will one of these days, it'll be named the Edward M. Kennedy Immigration Reform Bill. Thank you. Nice. Okay. Yeah. I think we're back up to the second row there. Um, my name is John Acton. I'm a freshman at the college. And you, of course, are a Republican. Um, <laughs> it, it's okay. I am, too. Some, I am too. some, uh, some call me rhino. <laughs> <laughs> but in the Republican Party today, there's definitely an increasingly vocal and influential strand of thought uh, that's I'd say pretty fundamentally ideologically opposed to almost everything you've said today. Um, and I'm curious, what is it uh, about the Republican Party that you think makes it the party with the best vision for this country? And if this strand of more libertarian thought continues to grow in the party, would it still be a party that you think has the best ideas it's, for America. I think, first of all, and the reason why Republicans took control of the House of Representatives was a lot to do with the economy. And the economy, when people are frustrated about their lives and, and the chances of success and their jobs, they become angry at government, and that's understandable. And there's always been in our party a wing that's kind of an isolationist wing, that more manifested in foreign policy, the so-called America Firsters before World War too, and, and after with the Taft-Eisenhower wings of, of our party. There's always been that, that battle. But, but in 2010, there was a movement called the Tea Party, and they won a lot of elections. Not unfairly, nobody stuffed the ballot box. It was expression of the majority of the people. And they got majority in the United States Congress. Does anybody contest that election? Of course not. It was a manifestation of the frustration that a large majority of Americans, particularly in, in, in uh, states that are between the coasts, uh, that, that, uh, that had had enough. And so we have battle in the Republican Party. And those are with, with primary challengers. If I run again, I guarantee you I will have a primary challenger. As Ted Kennedy once said, a fight not joined is a fight not enjoyed. But the uh, point is that um, that we have that battle. In the 70s, the Democrat Party went through a huge struggle. And then Bill Clinton came along and united the Democratic Party. And we, we're going to have to come together. We are going to have to. And I see some signs of progress in that uh, direction. Look, I'm of the party of Ronald Reagan. And I still think that history will judge Ronald Reagan as one of the greatest presidents in history. And Ronald Reagan said there's the 11th commandment, and that is you don't speak ill of your f fellow Republican. And Ronald Reagan said if a person is with me 80% of the time, he's with me. Now there's an element that says you've got to be there 110% of the time, and we're going to have to have that battle. Who's running the party then? Um, I think that, uh, one, Rents Priebus is doing a good job as RNC. But also, with all this outside money, you know, who was it said money is the mother's milk of politics? With all this outside money coming in, it diminishes the influence of the, of the party. A candidate now can go to, what do they call themselves, a Dements outfit, a fund for conservative, uh, yeah, yeah. A and they can go to them and get hundreds of thousands of dollars. Club for Growth or one of these where they don't have to d rely on their base of small donors and supporters. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, more questions. Yes, sir. Hi, Senator McCain. Um, I'm a freshman in the college, and my name is Victor Skinderi. I'm also a member of the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum Committee. And I have a question for you from one of our Twitter followers, Thomas Goddett. What do you think about the Supreme Court's latest decision striking down aggregate campaign contributions? I, I kind of mentioned that mm -hmm. earlier. I think, I think it's a disgrace. I think it's, you know, when, uh, my favorite anecdote, when Jack Kennedy became president, 
uh, he hired uh, and put in his cabinet the smartest and best and brightest. They were called the best and the brightest in America, McNamara and Rusk and all these people. And they went to Lyndon Johnson, who was then vice president, and said, what do you think about all these best and brightest, brightest people in America? And Lyndon Johnson said, I just wish one of them had run for county sheriff. <laughs> now, I just wish one of these Supreme Court justices had run for county sheriff. Mm. They would know the realism. Since when is money speech? If money is speech, then the person with the most money speaks the loudest. Okay. All right. Write that down. Okay, yes. Uh, hello, sir. My name is Connor Riley. I'm from Belvedere, Illinois, and I am not a member of the Republican Club here, and uh, I'm not a member of the ROTC, so I understand if your initial reaction is not to like me very much, but uh, <laughs> all, all I really have uh -huh. to say, it's, 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 no, it's no, a it's, free country. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes sir. but uh, I, I, I guess my mind's not, this can be your softball question, um, I, I, and I do mean this genuinely in the most unpolitical of ways. You are an American hero, and I, um, I look up to you very much. Thank and you. After a very long career of public service and, and looking back and all the people you've helped, I just wanted to ask, are there, are there any regrets at all? Is there anything? Oh yeah, every day I have regrets. Every day I have regret that I, that I didn't do a little more, that I didn't call somebody, that I didn't do a better job at, at, at something. But um, again, probably my greatest regret was the story I told you about the flag in South Carolina. Um, I, I probably could go back and look at some of the votes I cast and regret it. Oh, I'll tell you, when I was first in the House of Representatives, I voted uh, for a resolution that basically uh, supported apartheid in South Africa. Uh, a year later, I went back, I went to South Africa, and I saw the situation. I came back and voted differently, but I never should have voted the way that I did in, the, in that one. I could, I could probably go down the line, but as far as, uh, as far as any real huge mistake, Maybe running for president, <laughs> but other than that, I I, I can't. I've, every time I have done what I believe is the right thing, I've never regretted it. When I've done the, the political thing, which I have done, I have usually regretted it. And I, I, I'm All sorry, right. sir. Just give, I, I know I'm overstepping my bounds, but just given that, if you could go back to the beginning, would you do it again? Would you? Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. This is just oh, for yeah. me. Listen, personally. I can't tell you. Listen, I stood fifth from the bottom of my class at the Naval Academy. I was the worst disciplinary problem they ever had. <laughs> and, and look, I, I look I've, I've had, I am the luckiest person you will ever, you will meet some smarter people and some better people than me, but you will never hear from a luckier person than, than, than I am. I am so fortunate that I can't describe to you how grateful I am every day. Well, we have about five more minutes, so next question. Hi, Senator McCain. My name is Danny Banks, and I'm a freshman at the college. And I have a question that has to do with one of my government classes with actually Professor Diaz on the American president. And it has to do with how powerful do you view the Senate or individual senators um, to be to influence the foreign policy of the president? And has there been a change from the Bush administration to the Obama administration? I think. One of the people that I look at historically is a guy named Scoop Jackson from the state of Washington. He ran for president, uh, the nomination, and, and didn't, uh, didn't get it. And Scoop was a very liberal Democrat on all of the domestic issues, but on foreign policy, uh, he was incredibly effective because he was smart, he had people working for him that were outstanding. And for example, Jackson Vanek, I think when you look back at the history of the Cold War, you will see that the Jackson Vanek that required nations to allow Jews to immigrate behind the Iron Curtain was a huge tra uh, turning point in the whole Cold War. Now that was, not, that was opposed by Jimmy Carter at the time, but it turned out it was the right thing to do. So I think the Senate, if you use it right, you can really have an enormous influence. If you do it right and you get people to support you and you get a coalition, uh, look, um, for example, the uh, sanctions that are now taking effect on Iran that now everybody brags about has brought them to the negotiating table. 
those sanctions were passed over the objections of this administration. So if it hadn't been for the United States Senate acting, then you could draw a scenario where we would never be at the negotiating table in Geneva, which, by the way, I predict will fail, but that's neither here nor there. So, okay, yeah. I think we have time for one more question. Can we do Please. two more? Sure. It's okay. a, I thought you had no, an, an engagement, like do, so we're like to, happy to. No, I'd like to do a couple more. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, up there, uh, the young woman. Hi. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm out of <laughs> I'm out of order. Yes, Good afternoon, please. Senator. My name's uh, T.J. Min, Army officer uh, who's been through SEER training, where we watched Return with Honor, uh, where you have a prominent role. Uh, sir, what I guess is your definition? Could of I what just remind be you, it doesn't take a lot of talent to get shot down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I intercepted a surface-to-air missile with my own airplane, which was a lot of But Go you ahead. survived and you returned. And, sir, my question is, how should the United States uh, define torture, um, and what should our policy be? Thank with, you for that question. Guantanamo? My friends, I, there is one fundamental you need to understand. If you inflict enough pain on someone, they will tell you anything they think will make it stop. So when we talk about how the to torture does this and torture, torture doesn't do anything but violate the fundamental principles that we have of treatment of fellow human beings and a violation of the Geneva Conventions, which we are signatories to, and it doesn't work. And so, I, I, I th look, again, I think it's been gonna be a dark stain on American history, what was done uh, to many of these people we were held prisoners, and some of it that I've heard about and can't substantiate will shock you. Could we, could, we, could we do these sure. two? Absolutely, yes. Hi, my name is Auden Lawrence, and I'm a sophomore at the college, and I just want to thank you for being here. I have nothing but the utmost respect for you, and I'm so glad you're finally here. I've wanted you to come since I stepped on this campus and realized we had this opportunity, so thank you. Thank you. Um, I think that a so lot I of- I knew I asked for more questions. <laughs> 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 you got a lot more Republicans uh, um, in the tent. I think that there are a lot of people who would look at what's going on in Congress right now and kind of more broadly around our country and kind of see this gridlock and be disillusioned. And I think you are nothing if not someone who is a champion of compromise um, and has proven that it is possible. Um, and so I'm wondering if you have any advice for how people who still believe in the power of collaboration and compromise can make that happen today. Be glad to. One more word about torture, my friends. It brutalizes the torturer, too. Mm -hmm. There's a great film, a very old film, called To Die in Algiers, and uh, if you ever wanna, it's a really graphic demonstration when the French tortured people in, in Algeria. Um, I, th I think we are making a little progress on that front. Um, it's, it's, it's a, when you have a House of Representatives that their districts are so reapportioned that there's overwhelming majorities of one party or another in those districts, they're not ready to compromise. They're, they, they're just doing what, they're, what the majority of their constituents told them to do, and that's stand up for conservative or liberal, whichever, whichever it is, and that's a, that's a big problem. In the United States Senate, Harry Reid and I have known each other for many, many years, and we get along as friends very, very well. But when they did the nuclear option, it poisoned, which meant it only takes 51 votes to uh, confirm people and, and to move forward with legislation. It, it, it really poisoned the well. And I'm still dedicated to the proposition. In order to change the rules of the Senate, it was supposed to take 67 votes. They used a, a uh, parliamentary mechanism to do it with only 51 votes, and that was disgraceful. And that has really poisoned the environment here in, um, in the United States Senate because it deprived us of our rights of advice and consent by making it just a majority vote to confirm someone for an important job. And by the way, it means that they are getting more and more radical left people as nominees. It's, it's, it's very... It's very serious for the first, Robert Byrd 
and many of you don't know, is the most accomplished parliamentarian ever in the United States Senate. He was adamantly opposed to that. He was adamantly opposed to doing away with the rights of the minority. But that's one of the big problems. But I still keep hope alive. <laughs> okay, yes, please. Hello, Senator. Um, sorry, this, I'm too short for this. Um, thank you again for coming here, and thank you for your service. My name is Denise Garcia, and I'm a senior here at the college. My question um, regards Hispanic voters. So the state of Arizona is not very popular amongst the him Hispanic community for certain laws that have been passed. What can the Republican Party do to not only reach out to Hispanic voters, but also other constituencies such as young voters and female voters to demonstrate that? In the state of Arizona, we passed uh, a bill that, that was uh, very uh, harsh, to say the least, and most of which has been declared uh, unconstitutional, and it hurt us very badly, economically and job creation-wise and, and otherwise. Since then, we've been able to back off of that kind of behavior, generally speaking. I'm now happy to tell you that the business community in Arizona has now gotten heavily engaged in, in elections, and I think you're gonna see some changes in, in that. We had a clean, quote, so-called clean election law where all you had to do was go out and get about 50 signatures and $5 each and you were on the ballot. And so we kind of lost the, kind of the, the input, uh, economic, business, you know, principles of Republican Party uh, representation. Um, and I think our governor did the right thing by uh, vetoing a bill that was pretty bad just not, not long ago as regards to discrimination. All right, Great. is that? Thank you so much, <laughs> Senator McCain. My name is John Clark Levin. I'm a Master in Public Policy student here at the Kennedy School, and we study leadership a lot here, so I'd like to ask a bit of a reflective question through that lens. You ran for the presidency against George W. Bush and Barack Obama, and I'm not going to ask you to assess their relative job performance, but I, I would wonder, looking back on the challenges that America faced internationally and domestically during the Bush years and those that America faced during the Obama years. And which set of challenges do you think you would have been better suited to tackle as president had you been elected based on your temperament or experiences or leadership abilities and why? Hmm. Intriguing question. One of the things that I would have been different from both, one of the aspects is understanding Vladimir Putin. <laughs> um, really, both George W. Bush and President Obama had this idea that this was a guy we could work with, that he was on the path to democracy, that he really wasn't as bad as, uh, you know, George W. Bush said, I looked into his eyes and saw his soul, and, and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and in the campaign I said, I looked into his eyes and saw a K, a G, and a B, but the, uh, and then, and then President Obama, this same kind of thing, developed personal relationships. And by the way, one of the, if you look through history, you'll see that many really great leaders thought if they have a personal relationship, Roosevelt and Churchill with Stalin at Yalta, I mean, you can go back and see that they think that personal magnetism will override national interests. So um, I think that they both had that problem with, with Vladimir Putin. Um, I think you might argue that, that the Iraq issue, the reason why we went to war, was, as we all know now, not valid, okay? But at the same time, when the Secretary of State of the United States of America goes before the United Nations Security Council and presents evidence that Saddam Hussein has a chemi a weapons of mass destruction, then obviously that affects people like me, honestly. I said, oh my God, you know? Now, in the case of Afghanistan, I know we're all tired of Afghanistan, but let's not forget why we went to Afghanistan. It was because of 9-11. That's where the, the attacks came from. And of course, Americans wanted to respond uh, to that. Both of them, frankly, have mismanaged both conflicts very badly. We won, thanks to David Petraeus, the war in Iraq. We had it won. And then we pulled everybody out and in the words of General Petraeus, we won the war and lost the peace. Um, in Afghanistan, 
if we don't leave a significant number of troops there, and I'm talking about 10 to 12,000 US plus three or four Afghanistan, uh, I mean allied troops there, we're gonna see a replay of the Iraq uh, scenario. My friends, the bloodiest battle of the Iraq conflict was the ba second battle of Fallujah. We lost 96 soldiers and Marines, 600 wounded in that battle. Today, the black flags of Al Qaeda fly over Fallujah. And when I meet these family members, it's a little hard for me to explain to them what happened because we had it won. Uh, but look, for me to critique people that beat me, uh, defeated me in, in, in an open and honest election, I think is a little bit small-minded of me. And so I've tried not to, not to be critical of either one of them in the respect that how I would have done it different. And that, that's, so I've tried not to do that. We've probably come to the end of our uh, leash here. Could I just say that the last time I was here, I, uh, I encouraged uh, national service. Uh, people your age are criticized by old geezers like me for being your music and lifestyle and, and all of those things. But yet I see in this group and I see in young Americans a greater willingness to serve the country, frankly, than my generation. So I just encourage you to try to think about being involved, whether it be in a small way or whether it be devoting a year or two of your life after graduation to a lot of the programs that are available, and there are so many. I'm a great believer in national service. Again, I've never met anyone who didn't engage in one of these programs that wasn't forever grateful for having been a part of helping somebody else. And there's nothing greater than serving a cause greater than your self-interest. I thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. <laughs>